Have you ever wondered why some churches baptize babies while other churches only baptize adults? Well, today we're going to talk about that on Answering the Error. Hi, I'm Don Blackwell, and this is Aaron Gallagher, and we would like to welcome you to the program Answering the Error. On this program, we take videos that we have found on YouTube and other places on the internet, videos that teach religious error, and we examine them in the light of the Bible. Now, we want to say at the beginning, it's not our intention to be combative. We're not trying to be ugly toward anyone. Our intention is simply to teach the truth. You know, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 says, test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so that's what we're trying to do is to test the teachings to see if they match the Bible. In John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's only the truth that can make us free. And for that reason, we're very serious about finding the truth. And these are the reasons that we even have a program like this. Now, on today's program, we're going to be reviewing a video that was submitted to us by one of our viewers. It's dealing with the topic of baptizing babies. Now, the speaker is a Catholic priest, and he's answering the question, why does the Catholic Church baptize babies? Okay, let's roll the video. A question that I often get is, the question, why do we baptize infants in the Catholic Church? And oftentimes people ask because they wonder why we don't wait until the person themselves is able to make a decision for themselves. And that's a very valid question. Often I always think about the relation to our American ideals and the Western civilization and the experiences that we've had as to why we think that way. And, you know, we live in a culture very much that values making your own decisions, a freedom of choice, to be able to choose what you want to do and your own destiny and your own path. But when we look at this question, we have to remember that we, we don't just look in the way that the world views it, but we also look in the way in which the church and scripture and the history of our church answers that question. All right, Aaron, he just jumps right into the topic here, and he says people wonder why the Catholic Church doesn't wait until a person is able to make a decision for themselves, that is, uh, to be baptized. Mm -hmm. And then he jumps into a discussion of Western culture and how it has influenced our thinking. And in essence, he's arguing that this idea to wait until a person is able to think for themselves to be baptized, he says that is a Western culture that's given us this idea. Uh, this is not a cultural thing at all, is it? No, when you look at the New Testament, you look, for instance, at some of the last words that Jesus Christ spoke before, after the resurrection, before he ascended to heaven, and he gave what we sometimes call the Great Commission. Um, you can look at that in Luke 24, uh, Matthew 28, or Mark uh, 16. And Matthew 28, uh, the Great Commission was to go and make disciples of all the nations. So that's all nations for the last 2,000 years and any until he comes back. In Mark 16, you're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. So it's, it's not something that is specific to one time or one culture, but it really transcends uh, all those cultures since the first century when the, the gospel was established. That's, that's exactly right. Well, then he says, in order to answer this question, he says we need to see what the scriptures say how the church and how the history of the church answers this question. Now, first, of course he's right when he says we need to see what the scriptures say. You know, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11 says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. What does that passage mean? Well, it means that whenever we speak, we're supposed to speak like the Word of God does. Uh, Colossians 3.17 comes to mind that basically everything that we do in word or deed is supposed to be all in the name of, which means by the authority of Jesus Christ. So his allusion to going to Scripture, I would agree 100% with. Oh, absolutely. But then he goes on to, to say something else. What about the idea that he says we need to see what the church says and what the history of the church 
says. What about that part? That would be a really subjective way to look at something because you could go down the street in 2019 in America and you could find 50 different churches that teach almost 50 different things. So looking at what the church teaches is really can lead you in a lot of bad ways because a lot of churches teach things that are false. And then tradition is the same way. You can just pick a point in history and look and see that there are many people teaching things that are false. So all of that, we always have to go back and make scripture. That's what scripture is the authority. In fact, uh, the, the very uh, existence of 43,000 different churches in the world today tells us that there's a problem. If you're going to go back to see what the church teaches, uh, you're going to run into trouble. But the first statement, we agree, that is, we need to see what the scriptures teach about this. That's All right, exactly right. Let's continue the video. And so when we answer that question with the church, we have to look at it from two ways, in both scripture and in tradition. He says, we need to answer both from scripture and tradition. Now again, we just said we agree when he says that uh, we need to answer from the scripture. But what about this idea that we need to see tradition, that that needs to have a bearing on this. What do you say about that? When you look in the New Testament, sometimes people hear the word tradition, and sometimes there's almost two positions, either tradition is bad or tradition is good. But whenever you look in the New Testament, you have to notice there are two different types of traditions. For instance, Matthew 15, verse 6, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition, verse 9, in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Colossians 2, 8, philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men. So you have that bad sort of tradition that usurps or replaces the commandments of God. And then you have the good type of tradition. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the traditions which you were taught by word or by our epistle. So there's different types of tradition that's really important to distinguish between them. Right, and in that uh, passage he mentions the tradition that has come by the word, that is the inspired word, or by the written epistles. So you've got tradition that has come by the inspiration of God mm -hmm. or the tradition of men. Mark 7 and verse 8 says, For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men. So there's good tradition and bad tradition, as, as you're saying there. So he's told us up front there's going to be a problem with the way he's approaching this. He said we're going to look at the Word of God, but we're also going to look at tradition in order to answer this question. All right, let's continue. In Scripture, if we look back in the Old Testament, even going back to the time of Abraham, we see that the covenant that was entrusted to the people of Israel was that they would receive circumcision on the eighth day. So the young children, the young infants, were brought into the covenant of God even as young eight-year-old uh, babies. Okay, he does something very interesting here, Aaron. He is linking infant baptism. He's trying to answer why do we baptize babies. So he's linking infant baptism to circumcision, and then he mentions eight-year-old babies. I think he meant eight-day-old babies. And um, he's suggesting that since under the law of Moses, they were to circumcise babies at eight days, and when they did that, that, that brought them in to be a part of the covenant of God. And that somehow uh, baptizing babies is a similar thing. Uh, what's the problem with this reasoning? Well, I think there's a big problem if, with trying to, you need to make sure that you're not taking something from the Old Covenant and imposing it onto the New Covenant. The New Covenant, the New Testament, has to be the guide. For instance, there's a difference in the covenants. If we were to make it a one-to-one -one thing, let's ask this question. In the Old Testament, you didn't circumcise young females. Well, does that mean that you don't baptize females in the New Testament? Well, of course, we see examples of women being baptized in the New Testament. So it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, covering. And Jeremiah 31, in that promise of the New Covenant, it's, Hebrew, it's quoted in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 11. But the difference in the covenants, none of them shall teach his neighbor, and none saying his brother, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, the least of them to the greatest of them. And what that's referring is the Old Covenant, you were born into it, and then you had to be taught. The new covenant, you enter into the covenant after you learn, John 6, 45, you're, you hear, you learn, and then of course you're baptized, you're added to that covenant, but it has to happen as an adult. Uh, I think that's the perfect passage to answer this. Hebrews 8, verses 10 and 11, when he tries to make this comparison between circumcision and infant baptism, this shows you the problem with that. Mm -hmm. uh, they, there is a distinction that's made between the old and the new covenant. Okay, let's continue. 
And even throughout scripture in the Acts of the Apostles, we hear in uh, the stories of Lydia and her entire household being baptized. And St. Paul even writes several times referencing the baptism of entire households and mentions that many times in his letters. All right, I want to trace his arguments as he goes because he's trying to explain why the Catholic Church baptizes babies. His first argument is to uh, appeal to circumcision. And he mm -hmm. says uh, because of that reason we've got Old Testament, Old Testament precedent. The second argument that he is going to make is to suggest that the New Testament mentions entire households being baptized and specifically he cites Lydia and of course uh, Lydia we read about uh, her in um, Acts chapter 16 and verse 15 the Bible says and when she and her household were baptized she begged us saying da 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 but he appeals to that part she and her household were baptized mm -hmm. that is a proof that he he calls it a proof mm -hmm. that we should baptize babies is that indeed a proof that babies should be baptized well I think when you look at any argument you start out with, okay, it says that she was baptized and her household. So there's two, op there's two possibilities. Either there are children or there aren't. So you have to look for some more information. Well, number one, if there were children in that, number one, it would contradict other clear passages of Scripture. That's Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized. Then I would go in the book of Acts itself, you have Acts 11, uh, words to Cornelius' household, words by which you and your household will be saved. Well, can a baby understand words and obey them? No. Acts 16, you have the Philippian jailer. Acts 16, 33, he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Verse 34, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God, the jailer, with all his household. So those people that were a member of his household that were baptized, it says believed with his household. So obviously whatever people are being referred to have to be old enough to believe. Right. You know, I think it's very interesting that in order to prove that babies need to be baptized, he picks a passage that doesn't mention babies. Mm -hmm. And this is supposedly one of their best arguments. Mm -hmm. And I think that that uh, ought to tell people something because one of their best arguments doesn't mention babies. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep going. If we even go to what Jesus is talking about when he was in, talking about the importance of baptism, that all that come to him, that all that enter into the kingdom of heaven to receive, need to receive the gift of baptism, he also refers to letting the children come to him and not to let anybody hinder them. So he's calling everybody, not just the adults, not just those who can think for themselves, but everybody together to receive this great gift of baptism. Okay, I want you to notice what he's doing here. He is taking two completely unrelated ideas mm -hmm. and he's trying to tie them together to make a point. Mm -hmm. Number one, he suggests that Jesus taught that all should come to be baptized, which the Bible does teach. But then number two, he mentions that Jesus told his disciples not to stop little children from coming to him. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he concludes that little children should be allowed to be baptized. Now, what's the problem with what he's doing here? This one can be a little bit, it can take you some time to unpack it. He makes a reference about all that receive uh, the kingdom, speaking of Jesus. Well, in John 3, 3 through 5, Jesus did, in the context of baptism, say a man must be born again, verse 3, verse 5, born of water and the Spirit. But then he makes a jump to a completely different passage. He jumps to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 14, which is the context, the little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked him. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me, do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. So in, in Matthew 19, baptism is nowhere in the context. I could go all the way back if I wanted to make a similar argument. John chapter, or Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2, John the Baptist says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, there he's talking about the kingdom of heaven and says a person must repent. Well, a baby couldn't repent. So we have to be careful not to pull different you know, proof texts, one passage isolated from the context. Because you could teach about anything you wanted if you pull a passage from here and here and here and just line them up. And that's kind of what was being done there. Sure. Yeah, number one, he takes unrelated ideas mm -hmm. and tries to tie them together. But even if they were related ideas, it's interesting. He's talking about uh, letting the little children come to him, mm -hmm. which a newborn infant could not do. Mm -hmm. So even then, there's some sort of responsibility 
place. So even though it's unrelated ideas, it still doesn't work. But as you said, the key to the New Testament is New Testament baptism always has prerequisites. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about Acts chapter 8 and verse 35, uh, then Philip opened his mouth and uh, beginning at the same scripture preached unto him Jesus. And of course, this is the Ethiopian eunuch. And then they came to a certain water and the eunuch said, see, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And he said, if you believe, you may. See, he said as a prerequisite to baptism, faith, that is belief. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you have not done this, you are not prepared to be baptized, which of course uh, a baby cannot do. That's exactly right. All right, let's continue. And as far as the tradition answer goes, we know that the church has always done infant baptisms, and we know this from the history of our church, going back to even the earliest saints and even the church fathers, the apostles, the disciples of the original apostles who had been taught, and this had been handed on. All right, this is his third argument that he makes in defense of baptizing babies, and he says that if we look at the tradition of the church, we know that they always do this. Now the first two arguments I think would have been stronger arguments because he actually makes an appeal to something biblical. Mm -hmm. But here he says, we know from the tradition of the church that they always did this. Uh, what's the problem with this argument? Well, number one, I would even argue about the tradition. You know, you can go back and look at some of the early writers like, uh, for instance, Tertullian. and in some of his writings on baptism, he actually says he's talking about the delay of baptism for babies because he, he's one of the first writers that even mentions infant baptism, which shows that it was a rising problem at his time. And he says, why does the innocent period of life hasten to the remission of sins? His whole writing in chapter 18 of his uh, on baptism is talking about why would you baptize a baby? It's innocent at that point in time. And he says, wait till they get older, wait till they learn, wait till they learn to follow, then they're a candidate for baptism. So first of all, tradition, I would disagree that it even points to that. But second of all, tradition has been many times wrong. And so scripture always has to be our, our support. Right, right. That's exactly right. All right, let's continue. St. Irenaeus talked about this, St. Hippolytus, St. Augustine. Many saints referenced the importance of baptism of infants and in that all are called to receive this great gift. And it's something that we always have to look back and see that this is what the church has been doing. And this is from uh, 289 AD. There was even a church council in the Council of Carthage, if I remember correctly, in 252 AD that brought this very question up. And when they asked this question, it wasn't just the sense of should we baptize infants, but should we wait till the eighth day like they did in the Old Testament for the covenant, or should we baptize them, immediate, baptize them immediately? And the answer was to baptize them as soon as possible. Okay, this is a very interesting point that he makes because, again, he's arguing that we should baptize babies. He's citing tradition. Here, specifically, he cites a church council that is dating to 252 AD, mm -hmm. and he says they were discussing whether they should wait until the eighth day to baptize, but their decision was uh, to baptize as soon as possible. All right, how do you answer this? Well, once again, he's referring to tradition 252. Uh, when I just talked about Tertullian, I think Tertullian was born 130 to 140 and died, I think, in 205. So that's way before that. And honestly, that's still 220 years after Jesus. I mean, 2019, we go back 220 years to 1800. There's been a lot of departures from things in 1800 to now. So appealing to tradition because we can't find it in Scripture is really not an accurate way to determine you know, what Scripture is. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, We have in Scripture everything to make us complete, thoroughly equipped. Right. If I need something outside of Scripture, if I need tradition then Scripture is not complete, but Scripture says it is complete. You know, Second Thessalonians 3 and verse 6 says, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which you received from us. Mm -hmm. That is, inspired tradition that came from God. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, he cites tradition dating back to 252. He can't find tradition that dates back to the apostles. That's right. All right, let's continue. And perhaps the most important reason that we baptize infants is the very nature of what baptism is itself. 
and that is that it is when we are brought into the sheepfold of Christ for the first time, we receive that gift of grace that washes away original sin. Even though the effects of original sin remain, which we call concupiscence, we know that the grace of this sacrament washes away original sin and enables us to be a part of what Jesus Christ has asked us to do. He has invited us in to be his beloved sheep. He is our good shepherd. He watches over us with great love and care and compassion and mercy. And that is why we want to give that gift to everybody. Okay, this is his fourth argument for baptizing babies. And he said babies need to be baptized because of the problem of original sin. Now, of course, this idea of original sin is the idea that Adam's sin has passed on to all of his descendants, mm -hmm. that they inherit this sin as a baby, and thus babies need to be baptized. We want to say at the beginning of this, the Bible does not teach this idea of original sin. Uh, can you provide us with some passages that would prove otherwise? I personally like to go to Ezekiel chapter 18 because it's God is responding to this exact same sort of thought. In Ezekiel chapter 18, uh, in verse 2, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, here's the proverb, it sounds just like original sin, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, the children's teeth are set on edge. So the father does something and the children bears that responsibility. But if you go through, it says, verse 4, the soul that sins shall Shall die. Then if you get into Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, the soul that sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. Original sin says that all of the children bear the guilt of Adam. Ezekiel 18 20 says exactly the opposite, that the son will not bear the guilt of the father. That's right. Um, a couple of passages I like to cite because they're so simple. One of them is Matthew 19:14. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. The Lord said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to the nature of little children. Mm -hmm. Not the idea that little children are evil because they've inherited sin. Matthew 18 and verse 2, Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You see, the Bible teaches that the qualities of little children are models mm -hmm. for us to emulate, mm -hmm. not that they are um, totally corrupt sinners. In 2 Samuel 12, 23, when David's child died, David said, But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? His child? No, I shall go to him. David knew that his child had moved on to paradise. I would also point out Isaiah 59, verses uh, mm -hmm. 1 through 8. He begins in that discussion and he said, Your sins have separated between you and God. Not somebody else's sins. Mm -hmm. Not sins that I have inherited from Adam. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 8 he lists some specific sins, none of which a baby would be capable of uh, committing. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. And the history of it is ironic. In the New Testament you baptize only adults for the remission of sins. Well then around the time of Irenaeus, original sin, babies born sinful originates. Well then if baptism washes away sins, what do you have to start doing to babies? You have to start baptizing babies. Right. So original sin and baptizing babies fall right in line. With one false doctrine comes another one. You know, when you think about this question of original sin, mm -hmm. sometimes I like to put this question forth for people to consider. If babies are born as sinners and they have a sinful nature, then what happens to a baby when that baby dies? Mm -hmm. And if, that, if this doctrine is true, then that would have to mean that a baby is lost and is going to hell. And of course he would have no control over that. Many of the people who believe this doctrine uh, when they have this brought to their attention, they find it objectionable. Mm -hmm. They'll say, no, I, I don't believe that. But mm -hmm. if this is a true doctrine, then that also would have to be true. And we know the Scripture does not teach, like you said, that babies that die would go to torment. So we know that's not true. And a second question I'd like to ask is, if we sin because we have a sinful nature that we've mm -hmm. inherited from Adam, this mm -hmm. original sin idea, then why did Adam sin? That's a great question. Yeah. yeah, because they would argue that Adam did not have that. We inherit it from Adam. That's right. Okay, let's continue. You know, we never know when our time on this earth could come to an end. And to know that when we have that great gift, we can know that ourselves and our loved ones have received that promise of Jesus Christ, that He has placed His light in their heart, 
and that that light will shine on for all eternity. That's part of those promises that when we do the rite of baptism, we even have the Easter candle lit and we, we symbolically light the small Easter candle, the small baptismal candle, as a reminder that that light is being placed in the child's heart at that very moment and that we are entrusting this great gift that God has given us to the Lord to be raised. You know, parents always want to give their children the best gifts. And of course, who wouldn't? You want to give your child the best uh, of everything. And you know, even the things that you prepare for them, you know, parents start saving for their children's education early on. They start, uh, even from a young age, introducing them to sports so that they can develop talents and gifts and all these different things. And baptism is very much like that in the spiritual sense. You know, Aaron, uh, just as a side note here, we're getting short on time, but he says we want to give our children the best gifts, and of course mm -hmm. that's right. And of course, more than anything, we want to give our children the best spiritual teaching possible. Mm -hmm. That's why we're doing a program mm -hmm. like that. All right, let's continue. You know, we, we look at a person as a mind, a body, and a soul, a complete person, and all three of those things need to be taken care of. And just like a parent nurtures the needs of their child with uh, food and making sure they have the right nutrition and sleep, and they help them in their minds by learning, by making sure they get into the best schools, we also want to ensure that they are given the best spiritual uh, framework possible. And so when we give this, uh, when we, when we give this sacrament, this great gift, you're giving that initial grace, you're, you're uh, taking part in that and making that promise that you're going to raise this child to know Jesus Christ, to know his words, his love, his teachings, all these things, so that they can be given and grown in those good gifts and those good things. And that's what the grace of Christ does. It enables us throughout our entire lives to grow stronger to him, to be able to face the challenges, the trials, the difficulties in life, and to know that his grace gives us that strength. You know, this is interesting. He says, you're going to raise this child to know Jesus Christ. This is a rather ironic statement to me in a discussion of infant baptism because a person can't become a Christian. He can't enter into the Christian covenant mm -hmm. until he knows and can think and make his own decisions. Mm -hmm. And yet for him to bring that up while arguing that we're going to bring a child into the covenant mm -hmm. who doesn't know any better, uh, is rather peculiar. And he seems like a very nice guy. I'm sure yes. if I met him in, in person, I would love talking with him. But, and I agree that we should love our children and teach them, but 2 Timothy 3.15 comes to mind. From your childhood, speaking of Timothy, you've known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ. And we know that you have to be a believing adult to have faith. So you need to be an adult to be baptized for the remission of your sins if you believe on Jesus. Well, that's exactly right. Well, we are out of time. The Bible does not teach that babies are born in sin and that they need to be baptized. And we are thankful that you have joined us today for the program.